October 2nd, 1943. This week, humanity strikes back at the Nazis. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. As you can see, I am for the fourth time in Indy's war room as we have just come back from recording about our D-Day special in Normandy. This week, we also have two episodes after another for two separate weeks of War Against Humanity. This is the second. Last week, the Wehrmacht killed thousands of captured Italian soldiers of the Acqui Division. Slovene partisans obliterated the collaborationist Slovenian anti-communist volunteer militia. The genocide of the Jews of Europe continued with the deportation of Belgian nationals, the final liquidation of the Vilna Ghetto, and plans to deport anyone Jewish or considered Jewish in Denmark. The roughly 8,000 Danish and foreign Jews in occupied Denmark are not yet safe. By September 27th, the forces ordered from Norway by higher SS and police leader Gunther Panke have arrived, and he has over 1,500 local and German police, SS men, and local volunteers ready to begin deportations. At this point, the newly made de facto lead administrator of Nazi occupation, SS Obergruppenführer Werner Best, working for the Reich Foreign Ministry, gets involved. He knows of the deportation plan since September 18th and has cooperated so far. What happens next is a bit unclear. Best will later claim that he wanted to spare the Danish Jews, but evidence points towards that he either didn't agree with the deportation plan as it stood and hoped to regain some of his lost support from the Danes, or that he just made an administrative mistake. In any case, on September 28th, Best either wittingly or unwittingly allows, or perhaps even instructs, one of his diplomats, Georg Ferdinand Dukwitz, who will later claim his motivation is opposition to Nazism, to leak the planned deportation to the Danish administration. They immediately begin an improvised operation to hide anyone of Jewish ethnicity. The plan is to eventually get them to neutral Sweden. But until now, Sweden has refused to receive most refugees from Denmark. Ignoring that hurdle, in the dawn of September 29th, Danish officials have gotten hold of a police car and rushed to Copenhagen to inform Rabbi Marcus Melchior at the main Danish synagogue of what is about to happen. It's a Jewish holiday, and in an address that morning, Rabbi Melchior makes a public appeal to all Jews in Denmark to immediately try to get to Sweden or hide until they can. At the same time, in Sweden, the government is being pressured by the Swedish Jewish community and influential Danes in the country. By early afternoon, the Swedes have made an about turn and signaled to the Jewish council in Copenhagen that they will receive any Danish Jews and give them Swedish nationality and protection of deportation. As that news makes its way through the Jewish community, under at times chaotic circumstances, around 6,500 Danish Jews, close to 1,500 foreigners of Jewish ethnicity, and more than 600 non-Jewish family members are either trying to get to Sweden, looking for a hiding place, or already in hiding with non-Jewish friends or relatives in churches, hospitals, and similar places. The largely successful beginning of their flight is punctuated with scenes of desperation, with people wandering on beaches, hopelessly searching for a ship to take them over the straits. Isolated incidents of betrayal and subsequent arrest by the Nazis, and a few suicides. But for the most part, the Danes rise to the occasion, teachers instruct Jewish pupils to immediately go home and leave with their families. Doctors use ambulances to defy the occupation curfews and ship people hiding in their hospitals to the coast. Donations from sympathetic Danes pour in to pay for shipping and in ports all along Øresund and on northern Jutland, boats for the crossing are being scrambled. A two to four hour journey for which the skippers will charge at least 1,000 and in some cases as much as 50,000 Danish crowns per person at a time when the average Danish monthly salary is about 500 crowns. On the 30th, the Danish resistance calls for public protests. King Christian X writes a stern letter to Best, informing him of Denmark's opposition. The Danish bishops issue pastoral letters decrying the planned deportations. Across the country, public expressions of sympathy and protest go unpunished. In the night from October 1st to 2nd, a combined force of SS police and Danish volunteers raid the homes of the Danish Jews on Best's lists. They barely find anyone to deport. 
In Olborg, 82 arrests are made, and in Copenhagen, 198. To add further to the unclarity of Best's intentions, he now issues a statement of success. Since the objective goal of the Jewish action in Denmark was the de-Judaization of the country and not the most successful headhunt, it must be recognized that the Jewish action achieved its goal. Denmark is free of Jews, as no Jew who falls under the relevant regulations can legally live and work here any longer. But the Danish and foreign Jews are far from safe. Many have already made it to Sweden, but most are still in hiding, waiting for safe passage. In Sweden, the government is now under pressure to not only receive the Jews, but to take a public stand. Danish physicist Nils Bohr, of Jewish descent, leads an effort to convince Gustav V, King of Sweden, to intervene with the government. On October 2nd, a government statement that all Jews fleeing Denmark will receive safe haven in Sweden is broadcast in the regional radio news. In Rome, Italy, now under German occupation, another effort to save fellow Italians of Jewish ethnicity concludes at roughly the same time. On the 26th, Herbert Kapla, in charge of the SS in German-occupied Rome, delivers an ultimatum to the city's Jewish community. He wants 50 kilograms of solid gold and 100 million lire delivered to the SS headquarters within the next 36 hours, or else the Roman Jewry will be arrested and deported to concentration camps. Pope Pius XII offers to loan the money interest-free to the Jewish community. But before the deadline runs out, the money and gold has already been assembled through collections within the community and large voluntary donations by non-Jewish Romans. And the Roman Jews are safe for now. Further north, in Luxembourg, it is the opposite. On the 28th, the Nazis announced that Luxembourg is Judenfrei, free of Jews, when the last of eight transports leaves for Eastern Europe. In total, 674 Luxembourgian Jews have been deported, mainly to Auschwitz-Birkenau and Treblinka. Only 36 of them will survive the war. Meanwhile, on the Eastern Front, the SS effort to cover up their mass murders before the Red Army overruns German-occupied lands has picked up speed. The Red Army is inching closer and closer to Kiev, where in September 41, the Nazis committed one of the largest single mass murders of the war in Babi Yar Ravine. Subsequent mass murders have followed, filling the bottom of the ravine with layer after layer of tens of thousands of corpses buried under loose soil. This past August, under leadership of one of the mass murder's key perpetrators, Paul Blobel, a Sonderkommando of Jewish prisoners and SS guards designated 1005A began to clean up the evidence. Between August 18th and late September, inhabitants of Kiev would regularly witness large clouds of smoke rising from the site. By mid-September, Sonderkommando 1005B was sent up from Dnipro to help out. In total, between 100 and 150 policemen, 20 SS men, and about 330 Jewish slaves are now finishing the cleanup of the massacre site. The SS registers the exhumation and cremation of the remains of 45,000 corpses, although the likely number of people murdered in the various massacres is between 100 and 150,000 mostly Ukrainian Jews, but also Soviet POW, Ukrainian nationalists, Soviet partisans, and Sinti and Roma. The Jewish prisoners forced to carry out the work are treated brutally. Suspecting they will eventually join the dead they are disposing of, on September 28th, 15 of them use pliers and chisels to free themselves from their chains and escape. As they feared, the comrades they leave behind are killed and burned two days later on the anniversary of the first massacre, September 30th, 1943, making them the final human beings erased from existence by the Nazis during two years at Babi Yar. While the Germans are losing terrain in Eastern Europe, they continue securing lands in the Balkans. Between September 25th and early October, the Germans aggressively take the coastline around Trieste as well as the peninsula of Istria, barely a week after the partisans seized it from the Chetniks and anti-communists. The sweep into the region is accompanied by the usual murder spree of captured partisans and anyone remotely suspected of helping them. After the coastline is in German hands, they begin advancing into the Slovene interior and Ljubljana province, where the partisans are still holding out. 
to the west, on the southern end of the Italian peninsula, it is the United Nations alliance that is advancing on the Germans in Naples. But the Germans aren't just facing the Americans and British, they're also facing the Italian population. The Germans hold Naples for the moment, but plan to retreat behind a series of defensive lines running from the coast north of Naples across the peninsula to the Adriatic. Now, anti-fascist sentiments in Naples started brewing earlier this year when some Italians felt that Mussolini was mismanaging the country and he was fighting a war that wasn't serving Italian interests. Now, in September 1943, we see the first signs of a nascent organized anti-fascist resistance movement. After their takeover, the Germans have plundered the region for resources and arrested any political enemies. In the Naples province, 20,000 Italians are arrested on September 21st. Especially in Naples proper, the locals are on edge. The city has been bombed repeatedly by the RAF and the USAAF, and most homes don't have running water, electricity, or working gas connections. Most infrastructure and the sewage system are laid to waste, and typhus is running wild. The Germans, knowing they'll soon retreat, don't bother bringing relief and instead continue dismantling local industries and mining the harbor. Back on September 12th, an Italian sailor was executed for assaulting German soldiers. The execution was filmed for propaganda purposes, and an audience of 600 Italians were assembled to watch and clap. When German authorities call up all men aged 18 to 35 on September 26th for work duty, only 150 of 3,000 show up. In retaliation of this insubordination, 8,000 Naples residents are taken hostage. This sparks a public uprising. For four days, hastily created resistance cells storm weapon storage facilities, occupy bridges, and liberate prisoners. The fighting lasts until the Germans aggressively countered the rebels, killing up to 663 Italian partisans, militiamen, and civilians. In a spree of revenge, the Germans demolish the city as much as they can, wasting more buildings, the centuries-old university, administrative offices, public infrastructure, and burning the library of the Royal Society of Naples, including 200,000 of its books, many of which were unique and irreplaceable. After four days of fighting and pillaging, the Germans retreat from Naples on September 30th. German artillery continues to pound the city for the next days until Allied troops arrive and drive the Germans back beyond artillery reach. But the Germans have booby-trapped the city, with the worst effect coming in seven days when a time bomb will go off at a crowded post office claiming another 100 lives. Acts of terror that, in all its tragedy, is almost like when a petulant child breaks something they cannot have. But if anything is truly broken, it is the once impenetrable Nazi armor that continues to crack. In Denmark, in Rome, on the Eastern Front, and in Southern Italy, the cracks grow wider. Like when the curtain falls to reveal the mighty wizard as nothing more than a feckless, puny little man, the cracks reveal the true nature of the Nazis. Fearful, vengeful, petty little creatures who try to hide their acts of terror for fear of a bigger bully, betray their own murderous ideology for gold, and kill the unarmed in vengeance by remote control. An army of goblins sent forward by a wizard whose only true quality is being a hateful loudmouth and now spends his days in terror of the falling bombs hiding in deep forest bunkers and mountain retreats. To follow such goblin kings, to believe in their words, is joining a massive idiocy to become part of a vacuous crowd of cowards. But it is an easy thing to do, for it requires nothing more than ignoring your intellect and giving in to the lazy fear of the unfamiliar. The brave, on the other hand, do like in Denmark and Naples. Embrace the unknown, explore hope, and fight for the love of decency. Never forget. Mm -hmm.